Um, I'm that also year, uh, just I work fresh with the Peninsula Deanery and the Health Education here at the University, University Hospital Springs NHS Trust. Uh, uh, My name's Tim Hookway, I'm a consultant, obstetrician and gynaecologist in Plymouth in the southwest of England and I specialise in laparoscopic or keyhole surgery mainly for the treatment of endometriosis and other benign conditions. I went to medical school in London and um, then moved on to postgraduate specialist training in London before I moved to Wessex uh, further south to do a fellowship in complex laparoscopic surgery and the management of endometriosis and then about four and a half years ago um, I was appointed to my current job in Plymouth where my main role is to lead our endometriosis service and I've set up a nationally accredited centre for the treatment of endometriosis amongst some other things such as doing um, laparoscopic hysterectomies as a day case which has a number of benefits uh, for patients and also allows us to continue providing be uh, benign surgery through pandemics and when the hospital is um, full and we don't have many beds for elective patients. I, I enjoyed most things I did at medical school and I was fortunate to have a very good obstetrics and gynaecology placement in Chelsea in central London and I was very impressed by the passion of the doctors who worked in that specialty. I found it very interesting and I saw an awful lot of diversity within the specialty. I think I'd have been happy doing most, uh, most specialties, however it was um, obstetrics at first that really piqued my interest and I then began to develop my career in that direction. I picked a fairly generic set of uh, junior doctor jobs and then applied to do Obst and Gynae as a trainee in West London and um, the training then is what we call run through so when you have your job at ST1 you're given a training number and that means you're able to have jobs all the way through to becoming a consultant so you don't have to do basic training and then reapply you're, you, you can go all the way through. That does have a slight disadvantage um, in that some people do start and realise the specialty is not for them and so they'll drop out and also because you don't have to competitively interview it can be harder to keep your portfolio on track, keep up to date with everything but because I um, went through a further recruitment process for my fellowship in endometriosis I found that competitively interviewing at I think I was about ST6 at that point set me in a very good stead to be completely up to date for when I came along to a, a consulting job. I think uh, the application process was fairly straightforward. It was before we had nationalised recruitment, so I was interviewed by the London Deanery and I had a three station interview which was uh, 20 minutes on my portfolio, 20 minutes on a clinical scenario and 20 minutes testing my communication skills. And then I started work in South West London. As an SHO or a junior trainee, um, in Obs and Garnier, that's ST1 and ST2, you generally spend a lot of time on labour ward learning how to manage both normal labour and abnormal labour and also performing obstetric procedures such as caesarean sections and instrumental deliveries. Before you move on to ST3, you have to pass your part one exam, which is now a written exam and it's largely single best answer questions and EMQs. And when you pass your part one and you're signed off as competent to um, manage a lot of the basics of labour wards, you can then progress to ST3 where you often are the first um, on call for labour wards and you're expected to be able to, to manage the labour ward on a day-to-day -day basis. In many units you will have a senior registrar with you as well and so you are supported on site and here our junior registrars tend to only work during the day and we don't have them providing nighttime cover so as a trainee you do have very close senior support throughout your career and I think that's one of the things that's very beneficial in Obs and Gynae in that it's very consultant presence heavy 
you do get very good supervision, you do get very good training. Once you've uh, finished your ST3, often you would then move to a hospital where you are perhaps a little bit less supervised and able to start managing things slightly more independently. And then you have to have passed your part two and your part three to move on from ST5. Part two is a written paper and it's very, very, very clinical, but it does have a very low pass rate because it does test a very wide breadth of information. Um, it's a mixture of single best answers again and extended matching questions. The essays that I took are now a thing of the past. Should you pass the part two, you then are entered into the part three, which is the clinical examination. Um, it's now run as an OSCE format and is separate to the part two. It used to be that if you passed the part two, but then failed the oral examination, you had to resit your part two, and now those two exams have been uncoupled. Often international graduates are fine with the part two, but do struggle with the part three, because that does often test what we do in the NHS, and it does test how things are done in the UK, and perhaps if you've learnt your obs and gynae elsewhere, you may be unfamiliar with some of the things that are done, and so, actually working in a UK unit is very good preparation for, for the part three. At SD6 and 7, you have a bit more choice in your training and you're able to tailor what you do more to where you want to be as a consultant. And you opt to do these modules called advanced training um, specialty modules. And they are ones that can help to define your career. So you can do ones more in obstetrics and do managing the labor ward. You can do fetal medicine, you can do maternal medicine, you can do advanced antenatal care, you can move more to gynaecology, you can do benign gynae surgery, you can do urogynaecology, emergency gynaecology, abortion care, the menopause, hysteroscopy. There's a whole wealth of, of options and often people would choose one big one such as benign gynae surgery that sort of defines your career and then maybe one or two smaller ones that give you a few extra skills and you need to have at least two to gain your CCT. As somebody who's predominantly a gynaecologist, I've got three. I do provide labor ward cover and I do really enjoy my obstetrics. And so I've got my advanced labor ward module. I've also done benign gynae surgery and I've done advanced laparoscopic surgery, which makes me somebody who is a dedicated gynaecologist. I run a specialist service in the endometriosis. I also contribute to the general work of the unit and I'm also an accredited colposcopist so if women have an abnormal smear test then I'm able to deal with with that result and all of those things put together make for a very interested enjoyable and varied job. So in OBS and Gynae, we have doctors at all stages of their career. We have foundation doctors, we have uh, doctors who are in the GP VTS scheme and are on their way to becoming GPs, and we have specialist trainees. A lot of the junior doctor role in OBS and Gynae is very similar to that in other parts of the hospital. And I think there's often very little exposure to gynaecology in medical school, and perhaps people are quite intimidated about coming to us. Pregnancy can well, you, you can see pregnant women in all areas of, of medicine and actually often to know how to deal with a pregnant woman who happens to have a separate condition is quite an important skill. And often to take pregnancy out, the, out of the equation, think, what would I do normally? And then think, given that this lady's pregnant, how does that change what I need to do is a good way of approaching things. I think to read a little bit of... Um, information about the basics of OBS and Gynae will be really helpful before you start. Uh, but when doctors do start with us, we do go over the basics of how to prescribe in pregnancy, um, some of the common physiological changes in pregnancy, so how people might behave differently because they're pregnant, and, and also some of the acute gynaecology things, because we, do, we are fully aware that you may not be confident performing spectrum examinations, you may not understand early pregnancy and there's a lot of support around to help people get to start working in our department. 
as I say, though, in general, a lot of the basics are the same. We still have uh, women who are both pre-op and post-op. We have emergency admissions who, for example, if you're seeing somebody who might have a ruptured ectopic, you're looking for signs of hypovolemia. You're looking for signs of internal bleeding. You want to be able to fluid resuscitate somebody. So in the same way that if you encountered somebody who uh, was having an obvious hemorrhage, you would want to get some IV access. You'd want to give some fluids. Exactly the same in, in gynecology. Likewise, on the labor ward, there are probably many new words that you've not heard before. There are many new things that are going on. But by and large, if you're called into the room for an emergency, what's expected of you is to be able to put a large drip in, take some bloods and maybe put some fluids up. And actually the rest of the stuff in terms of managing postpartum hemorrhage, man managing a shoulder dystocia, um, they're often done by more senior doctors, but we do run training days to, to understand how to run these emergencies because a shoulder dystocia is a life-threatening event and actually the time to learn how to do it is not during the, the event, it's in simulation training beforehand so you're equipped with the skills ready for when, when you need them. Uh, if people do want to develop a greater interest, um, we're very happy to, to teach basic suturing and uh, some parts of a caesarean section or a laparoscopy and that sort of thing. And there are many doctors who come to Wobbs and Gunny not knowing much about it, but actually leave wanting to join us uh, in the specialty on the longer term basis. Um, I think it's, it's a very varied job. It's very challenging. I like the variety with it. I like the fact that I'm... I describe myself as a quality of life gynaecologist, so as an endometriosis specialist, a lot of my, my patients have quite significant pain, have a lot of, potentially a lot of problems conceiving, and actually it's really, um, really rewarding to be able to treat people that makes a real difference to their quality of life. So um, I love hearing back from patients that their pain's got better, that they've been able to get pregnant, that sort of thing. Is, is incredibly um, rewarding. Um, I do really enjoy the variety. Um, I enjoy the, the various challenges that labour ward uh, presents and one never quite knows what they're going to encounter on any given day or night on, on the delivery suites. And, and again, the, the surgery is, is interesting, it's challenging, it's complex. Um, and by introducing new techniques um, such as microlaparoscopic surgery for day case hysterectomy, um, you, you can see that um, you're making a real difference in the way that we practice medicine and um, uh, one can be quite innovative in the specialty as well. Um, I, I think people do think that obstetrics is quite a nice specialty and it's it's very sort of I think fluffy is probably the wrong word but you might sort of see where I'm going with this um, but actually the harsh reality is that there can be things that are quite traumatic physically and emotionally and one does need to develop a significant degree of resilience to cope with those sorts of things and I think as a result if you go into most um, obstetrics departments you'll find the consultants are a very good close-knit team and actually we're very good at looking out and supporting each other and whilst there are a lot of challenges in the specialty there are a lot of you know what what I do or don't do can have a profound effect on the life of not just a woman but her family her friends everything and, and actually it is possible you know, one does feel quite a lot of pressure in that in, in that event and so to have a good supportive team around you is incredibly important so a lot of obstetricians and gynecologists are very good team players um, we all get on very well and it's a very nice department to work in despite the fact that what we do on a daily basis can be very challenging um, so if you think about pregnancy um, if you get pregnant you're generally booking with your, your doctor. It often is an online form these days. You then see a midwife who will go through a lot of information. And if there's any reason for you to see an obstetrician, you're then booked for consultant-led care. And you normally come to the antenatal clinic around about 16 to 20 weeks. And then you're seen as an outpatient by 
uh, one of the consultants or their team and we can make a plan for your pregnancy and, and go from there. Sometimes people will come into the labour ward as an emergency. Some people might not know they're pregnant until they come in and it's diagnosed when, uh, when they're in the hospital. And then obviously we have the labour ward for women who are in labour. There are um, midwifery-led units in the country as well. So if you have a low-risk pregnancy, you could have a home birth, you could deliver in a midwifery-led unit, or you could be on, on the labour ward. In gynaecology, if you had an emergency that um, the emergency department felt was uh, gynaecological related, then one of our specialists would come and see you and we could arrange some scans, we could look into an ectopic pregnancy, we can try and work out what's going on. That's one way of becoming one of our, our patients. Often women will go and see the GP because they've got heavy periods, they've got recurrent pain, they've got difficulties with intercourse. Um, they've got menopausal symptoms and then your GP would make a referral into one of our clinics. We'd then see you as an outpatient and from there we can arrange further investigations, we can arrange treatments, we can arrange surgery, uh, whatever it is that's required we can do during a discussion in our clinics. There are other things like the National Cervical Screening Programme, so um, all women are invited for a, a smear test every three years or so. And if one of those was abnormal, you'd be referred directly into one of our colposcopy clinics where we would go through the results with you, examine your cervix and um, do whatever was necessary from there. So there are lots of ways of becoming one of our patients. It's often done either through emergency care or through um, the, the, the local GP. I think Whenever I talk to anybody about their career, I often say, have a look at the consultants, see what the consultants do, what do they like, could you see yourself fitting in with, with those people, do you like their work-life balance, do you think what they do is interesting? I think every specialty does have some years where it's more challenging than others, and actually if you're looking at a very stressed, burnt out registrar who's stuck in ST5 and hasn't passed their exam, they may give you a very different overview of the specialty to somebody who's an ST2 who's doing really well and really enjoying everything. So I, I think to remember that training is a much shorter part of your career than your job as a consultant. And so when you're choosing what to do, look at what people do in the long term. You're signing up for maybe 10 years of training but then maybe 20 or 30 years of being a senior doctor. And I think to, to note that is, is quite important. I think find out about us, found out, found out as much about it as possible. Maybe come and spend some time with us on the labour ward, maybe do some taster weeks if you're a foundation doctor, and we can give you a good overview of what you might experience as, as a consultant. Most of us are very approachable and very happy to talk to you about what you might experience during a, a career in Obton Gynae. And I do appreciate that, you know, whilst I had two and a half months of obstetrics at medical school, it's now down to a couple of weeks in a lot of medical schools. So I think the difference between undergraduate and postgraduate Obton Gynae is now huge. And so to get as much information as possible would be brilliant. If there were trust grade jobs available, then we'd be very happy to have somebody for a few months to, to try being in Obstagani and seeing what, what you thought of it. And we wouldn't be slight in, offended in the slightest if you felt it wasn't for you. But if you felt you wanted to, to pursue the specialty, we'd be absolutely delighted.